Well, we have with us today uh, Sheriff Aaron Hansen, Douglas County Sheriff, that is. And uh, we wanted to talk to um, Aaron a little bit about just, you know, some of the uh, the street crime and homelessness that's going on in, inside the county, sometimes in parts of the county that come as a surprise uh, to some people. But first of all, Sheriff Hansen, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I wasn't here the last time you were on because you were substituting for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it was, good. Uh, it was and he still came ago. back. <laughs> <laughs> he still came back. So, all right. Um, well, well, Aaron, um, I saw something uh, on a WWT article that, that, that featured uh, uh, your office and, and the activity of some of your deputies yesterday that, that caught my eye. It made reference to the number of homeless people being up 200% uh, in, uh, and it was either Omaha or Douglas County in, in the last five years. And just anecdotally, I'm, I'm a guy who goes downtown a lot. I'm out and about um, suburban and urban. And anecdotally, it just feels like there are more people on the street than there used to be. Yeah. And it's not just, it's not just something that Douglas County is struggling with. You see it across the country. And, you know, we're very, very fortunate in Omaha and Douglas County. We've got, we've got great, strong, common-sense leaders like Mayor Stothert. Uh, we've had great governors. Uh, I think for the most part our, our county boards and our city councils have been, you know, very responsible, common-sense leaders. But I do think that we have to keep a close eye. When we see homelessness uh, trending up and when we see things like juvenile crime trending up, you have to look at what's happening across the country, whether it's San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, and their explosion of homelessness and homeless crime and how that's impacting businesses, or even like Philadelphia, where you're seeing this explosion of looting, and primarily by young people uh, as a result of their soft on crime policies and juvenile justice reform. So as long as I'm sheriff, you're going to hear me ringing that bell to try to communicate and educate the public and our policymakers uh, and the media because we have to get ahead of those challenges. We're better in Douglas County, we're smarter, and we need to learn from what other communities have done wrong before we repeat those same mistakes. So um, you are uh, you have been speaking publicly lately um, about homeless encampments, and uh, there's a number of them that – uh, are very near people, but kind of out of sight uh, under bridges and things like that. And we've talked, um, we've heard you talk in the media a little bit about some of the crime that can come out of these things. And it creates a bit of a controversy in our community because a lot of people will say, well, homelessness is not a crime. But yet where there is a lot of homeless uh, people and, and the addiction and mental health issues that go with it, there tends to be a lot of crime. Yeah, you, you know, and they're right when they say homelessness is not a crime and we should not criminalize homelessness. I agree with that. Uh, but I think we also have to come to terms with the sad reality that the vast majority of people in our community that are struggling with homelessness, uh, it's less about maybe losing their home or less about affordable housing and more about chronic substance abuse, addiction, and, and unaddressed mental health, uh, mental illness. You know, it, we are very fortunate in Douglas County. We have a surplus of shelter beds. A lot of people don't realize that. There are so many empty shelter beds and shelters in this community. And unfortunately, the, the many of the individuals, the majority of the individuals that live in the tents, they will tell me when I ask them, I don't want to live in the shelter because they want to do what they want. Um, they don't want to have a curfew. They want to be able to use drugs or alcohol. Um, and, and, and they know that the shelter gives structure and consequences for bad behavior. So that's why you'll see them in tents. And it doesn't help. We've got some nonprofits here in town who I think have, have very good intentions. They're naive, in my opinion. But when they some of these nonprofits enable uh, these Giving people, them tents. Giving them tents. Um, tents that, I mean, I think a lot of us would be pretty jealous of as outdoorsmen. But it doesn't help when you give them tents because – they end up under bridges. They end up in our tree lines. They end up in our creekways. And those areas become crime hotspots because those and folks, trashed. they have to live. Yeah, litter. It's an environmental disaster oftentimes, humanitarian disasters. And those individuals have to eat. And how do they eat? Well, they usually eat by stealing from others, either uh, uh, stealing property and selling or stealing property to fuel their drug addiction 
And, and we have to come to terms with how, how sad that reality is if we can really find a solution that's long-term. So go ahead, Trenton. Well, as you, as you were talking about, how do you help someone who doesn't want to be helped or doesn't know they need help? They don't want the curfew of the shelter. They 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 want to have a their own lifestyle, and you can't lock them up. Well, you you can lock them up if 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 they've committed a crime or whatever. But it's really a conundrum, isn't it? Yeah, it's really it's it's going to take a multi front approach. And so let's take for example the sting operation that my agency did in Millard here lately. So we received multiple complaints from parents about uh, uh, mentally ill, uh, allegedly drug addicted homeless uh, men in the Millard area that were when I say molesting, I don't mean sexually molesting, but molesting young people, stealing their bikes, chasing after them, making them feel afraid. And so we set up an operation, uh, knowing that these individuals like to steal bikes for whatever reason, set out a, a very valuable bike, which was provided to us by a nonprofit here locally, Team Bike Rescue of Omaha. And uh, within 40 minutes, the, the target, uh, the suspect that was we knew was molesting young people, stole the bike. And so we, knowing that we had tried every other option, we tried connecting him with services, he refused, he went to jail. Uh, charge not only with stealing the bike that we put out in the operation, but stealing the young man's bike a few days prior. We coordinated with the county attorney to go to the judge and say, Your Honor, if he gets a cash bond, which he will, give him strict structure. Put him on 24-7 supervision, potentially an ankle monitor. Make him report daily to take a drug test to ensure that he's, ensure that he's not uh, drinking or, or drug impacted. Give him intense structure if he does get released. That's the type of uh, innovative problem solving we're going to need. But ultimately, he's going to get out from underneath these charges. He'll serve his time. Uh, and we need to figure out where does he go next. And that's where the, the behavioral health infrastructure uh, discussion starts, whether it's an additional uh, regional center like we have in Lincoln. We need one in Omaha, in my opinion. Or whether it's enhanced uh, private behavioral health uh, infrastructure, like in the various hospital systems, we need better infrastructure. Okay, so um, we keep hearing a lot about that uh, the the lack of behavioral health and mental health services uh, facilities, and the fact that it's a crisis. Any idea about what it would take, other than just money, uh, what it would take to make something like that happen? I mean, it does seem kind of crazy that we don't have a version of the Lincoln Regional Center in. Uh, where the, most of the people are in the state. First, what is the Lincoln Regional Center? It's not a. Are you talking about a prison? Or are you talking about? No, it's it's actually managed by the Department of Health and Human Services. It is a mental health facility, and it's primarily used by the various boards of mental health across the state. It's so a locked facility. Though. It is a secure facility, and so unlike uh, maybe a standard inpatient inpatient treatment center, you can't you can't just walk out. And it's designed and staffed appropriately, knowing that they're dealing with high risk. Uh, mentally ill individuals. And so that's, again, it, I've talked to the sheriff in Lancaster County. I said, hey, is it great having a regional center in, in your county? I mean, it's got to be great, right? And he goes, no, because it's always full with people from Douglas County, with people from across the state. They struggle to get people into it as well. So if you have a if you have a person, man or woman, who uh, is, is dealing with drug abuse, mental health issues, they're on the street, they don't have connections with family, the, the, the interpersonal skills, what, what have you. If they don't have income, a job or handouts or something, and structure in their lives, how do you, how do you put those people on a course to, to, to reform and become not just productive citizens, but to, to better their lives? That's the challenge. There's a lot of people that believe uh, that the harm reduction approach is the best way to go. They think if you just give these folks a house, that everything will, will work itself out. Well, I don't believe that. If if you are if you are if you are given a house, and you didn't earn it, and you don't know how to maintain it, and you're still a drug addict, and you still have unaddressed mental health issues, you're not only going to destroy that house, you're going to destroy the houses around you as well, and the people who live around you. So I think. I'm a firm believer in uh, shelter first, housing earned, where you give people shelter and you make sure that they have that layered support, whether it's behavioral health services, uh, substance abuse services, or for the chronic cases, we have to find that infrastructure to put them in 
to give them those services, then get them into the shelter, then work them towards rehabilitation and housing. But but what I've heard is a common theme, whether it's parents of kids, uh, private homeowners that are struggling with these challenges in their communities. I hear a lot from the business owners. The business owners are like, this is hurting my business. People don't want to come into my restaurant. They're afraid to frequent my store. I have people defecating in front of my in front of my business, and something has to be done. These are the core quality of life issues that law enforcement and government need to focus on so that business can thrive. Yeah, and if anybody listening th- says, I tuned into the Grom Hush show, and it's about economic development and commercial real estate, it, this is, because all you have to do is, is look at Target closing nine locations due to organized crime. You see Philadelphia with the flash mobs, all these kids going in. If, if we don't take care of this and nip this in the bud early, we're going to end up like some of these cities where you have huge retailers moving out of these neighborhoods. We have with us uh, Douglas County Sheriff Aaron Hansen for a few more minutes. And, uh, Sheriff, we were talking about you know, these homeless encampments and that sort of thing. Is it trespassing for someone to live on city or state property? And uh, as, as, as a semi-permanent resident who pitches a tent or something like that? It, it can be. It sets uh, up a tent. It, it, can, it, it, it can be. Uh, it all depends on what location. Um, you know, there's some areas that are obviously very, very concerning for people to uh, to put up a tent um, under infrastructure. I mean, the, look at how much we talk about vital infrastructure and infrastructure safety. I was just uh, at a homeless camp here in Douglas County that's under a state highway and mm-hmm. we're coordinating with the state department of transportation about this, but the homeless uh, camp underneath the state highway has actually started to secure their uh, tents uh, into the underside of the bridge. Uh, so pounding items into the concrete, uh, let alone all of the erosion, which is occurring under the bridge in the Creek way. And, and again, there's a price to be paid for that. This is vital infrastructure there's a reason why we don't allow people to, you know, lease camp camping spots underneath them, and they're the, usually the only uh, recreational activity under a, a bridge is a walking trail. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think again we, we've got to we've got to take a broader look. Is it smart to have people living under tents? Uh, is it safe? Uh, I I hear from a lot of people that uh, their kids or them uh, jog up and down trails uh, here and along our NRD trail system. Um, and they're afraid of some of the people that they encounter. Just this morning, I had a, a constituent call me and say he was chased by a homeless man along a Keystone Trail threatening to slit his throat. Um, and that was proximate to a bridge. So, you know, again, there, I don't think there's any good reason to, to camp under a bridge. So we were talking briefly uh, before the break about uh, what's going on in cities like Portland, San Francisco, where they have the smash and grab problem. And then you made reference or one of you made reference to Philadelphia Tuesday night. They had a massive um, outbreak of uh, retail looting. It was four, it was, it four was, stores on the same strip. Yeah. Right. Some of it was right down in, in, in the heart of downtown Philadelphia, which is a very cool place. Um, and some of it was a little bit further out, but it was coordinated. And, and a lot of the coordination was kind of out in public and that sort of thing. So, so, so thoughts about that. Part of that is, you know, they're pretty, la- they have some pretty laxed prosecutors um, in places like Philadelphia for things like that. But from your perspective as, as sheriff, what do we do to make sure we never get anywhere close to what happened Tuesday night in Philadelphia? Well, uh, you know, unfortunately, some of our public policies we've made lately, uh, we, were, we were edging that direction. It was good to see our county board recently decide to keep DCYC, our youth center, open, uh, not replace it with a smaller youth center. Uh, and, uh, and I know there's a broader conversation happening on the state level and the local level about maybe whether we went too far in our juvenile justice reform laws, removing consequences for bad actions. And again, this is a show about business development, economic development. I guarantee you there's a lot of businesses in Philadelphia and on the West Coast right now who are wondering, where did we go wrong? I wish we would have been more engaged with our lawmakers. Never did I think as a business owner I would have to be engaged in social justice and criminal justice reform issues. And this is a prime example why we need to. Philadelphia was primarily teens. And they weren't stealing food. 
Uh, unlike uh, some Congress people that were saying they were stealing bread to feed their families, they were stealing iPhones and smashing them and liquor and electronics, and it was just a free-for-all in Philadelphia um, because they've been normalized to the reality that there is no consequences for those behaviors. People talk about California and how the felony threshold is $1,000 or more. So you can walk into a store, steal $1,000 or less, and it's a misdemeanor, $1,000 or more is a felony. People complain about that. We did that in Nebraska seven years ago, but we made it $1,500. Less than $1,500 is a misdemeanor. And we had state senators last session asking to up that even more. So these public policy decisions have consequences. We need to think about innocent people and in, in our business community when we're making them. It rarely is, is the answers as simple as the uh, social justice uh, progressive crowd think they are. One last question uh, before we get you out of here, uh, Sheriff, and that is we've got a lot of people listening to the show right now, undoubtedly, who are really focused on the the human side of this whole deal. And and um, to their credit, they desperately want to do something to help the situation short of getting involved in politics. What are some things that the average Omaha person who could do that don't enable bad behavior or continued addiction and continued homeless, but still could make a difference and, and uh, maybe advance the community? So I'd say two big things. Number one, support uh, the shelters that are doing it right. Uh, like, you know, we've got we've got a lot of them. Santa Francis House, Lydia House. If you go into the four corners of those facilities, I know sometimes outside in the public areas, it, it doesn't look as, as mm-hmm. positive, but inside there's a lot of good things going on. There are shelters, there are miracles, uh, substance abuse rehabilitation system. They run a tight ship at those homeless shelters uh, here locally. Support them. But also, even more, just as important, be engaged with your elected officials on the county level, the city level, the state level, and the federal level. Everyone needs to do their part to make sure we address this challenge because Ultimately, if everyone's not acting as a coordinated team on this, we're not helping the vulnerable people that need that help the most, whether they want it or not. And we're sure as heck not helping the innocent people and innocent business owners that, uh, that are proximate to those, to those vulnerable people. So we need to keep the conversation robust and we need to be honest about the challenge. Well, um, Aaron, we appreciate you joining us. Thanks to uh, you and your deputies and all the civilian employees that are doing such a great job for us. Appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Sheriff Aaron Hansen, Douglas County. If you like this video, be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons. And remember, Grow Omaha is not just media. This is a mission. We are trying to build up Omaha and make it an even better place. We can only do that with your help. Share this video with your friends, neighbors, and family.